Robert Fleischer. Um, I met him, it'll be last year now, is it? Yeah. Last year. Yes. Um, yes. I'm not offending you by doing that. I mean, I, no, I, it's all right. It's all I, right. I think Germans are very it's good. It's all right. I won't mention the Brexit, though. <laughs> Who said the Germans don't have a sense of humour? <laughs> I didn't think they had. But, they, but anyway, yeah, Robert, he invited me over to his hometown of Leipzig, which is beautiful in eastern Germany. I, I served two and a half years in the Royal Air Force in Germany, so I knew it was a beautiful country, but never been what was in the east. And Leipzig was a beautiful uh, historical city with beautiful architecture. So that was very kind of him, and obviously we struck up a friendship. Robert Fleischer is the leading expert by far in the country of Germany, in my opinion. Now, what you've got to understand is, if we think we are hard done to in Britain, with the coverage, the fair coverage in Germany, and from our previous conversations when I was over in Germany with him, he has a 50% harder time. But they still have cases, and this guy is trying to change things, He's even asked questions to politicians, and they kind of like react with horror. Seriously. And you'll so, see that. <laughs> and you'll see that. So without further ado, a round of applause for Robert Fleischer. Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you very much. This is the very first presentation uh, I give in the United Kingdom, and I'm very honored to be uh, a speaker at this um, conference, and I would love to thank Gary and all the organizers of this fantastic conference. And don't clap your hands yet because I haven't spoken yet, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit before I go uh, into uh, the, the, the subject. I'm actually not a ufologist, I am a journalist. I used to work for television, and the thing is, when I was 16 years old, I met the Swiss author Eric von Däniken. Do you know him? Yes. Chariots of the Gods. and. Whenever he was in my region and gave a talk, we would meet because we, um, we would meet regularly when he was in my region and we would talk for many hours and I was fascinated by what he said and I said, so why isn't this on television? And he said, well, why don't you go and work for television and report on this kind of stuff? And I said, yeah, good idea. <laughs> so, so when I was 16, I, I, really, I started doing internships in several local, local newspapers. When I was 18 years old, I presented the evening news at a local TV station in my hometown, and later on I, I worked for several major German TV networks, most of the time for MDR television, which belongs to ARD. That's comparable to the, that's a public broadcaster service comparable to the BBC here in the UK. So I had already worked as a journalist before I started doing my university uh, studies, and um, I chose uh, conference interpreting, so I have a university degree in, in conference interpreting for French and Spanish because I didn't know hardly any journalist colleague who had studied journalism in order to become a journalist, and I thought that uh, languages would come in quite handy. What do we know about the situation in Germany? I guess in the UK, uh, people probably don't know many things about uh, the UFO situation in Germany, and that is because Michael Hesemann, uh, who did what I've been doing um, 20 years ago, um, he stopped working in this, in this field and he uh, decided to write books about the Catholic Church. And also UFOs are a taboo subject in Germany. So in 2007, I decided to found Exopolitics Germany, this website, and, a, and then another couple of years later, I founded Exo Magazine TV, which is an online video portal for open-minded people, which covers more subjects than just UFOs. You see, we have remote viewing um, and all that. And that's on a, on a subscription basis, and it's only in German yet. There are private UFO organizations in Germany, so registered associations of people uh, dealing with uh, UFO research. Four of them. The oldest ones are, where was that? Okay, the oldest ones are those, uh, 44 years and I think 43 years or so. Um, and this is a very new association. Um, this one is MUFON Central European Section. You may have never heard of it before. 
and it was founded by uh, the German astrophysicist Illobrand von Ludwiger, who is a, um, a very important uh, figure in the field of German UFO research, I would even say on an international level, because he helped um, to bring forward some material during the Rockefeller Initiative, if you know what I'm referring to. And later on he uh, quit this organization and he founded his own, another one that was only a couple of years ago, which also focuses on anomalies. So there's basically nothing you ever hear about UFOs in Germany because officially they don't exist in Germany, but you may have heard of this in July 2015. Daily Mail, the, the Mirror and the Sunday Express started reporting on um, a top secret documents and German government forced to release top secret documents on UFOs and Angela Merkel forced to release secret UFO files and the and the Sunday Express wrote, Robert Fleischer of exopolitik.org discovered that the scientific serv service of the German parliament had a department investigating the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence and UFOs. So top secret documents and a department within the scientific service researching UFOs, it's both wrong. So what actually happened? And It actually, it all goes back to a United Nations decision from 1978, which I'm sure you're aware of. In uh, 1978, um, the um, General Assembly invited interested member states to take appropriate steps to coordinate on a national level scientific research and investigation into extraterrestrial life, including UFOs and to inform the Secretary General of the observations, research and evaluation of such activities. So I made uh, some research at the political archive of Germany's foreign office and I found out that this aim, the original aim actually, had not been to, I mean this is very general, you know, invites interested member states and stuff, the original aim had been to um, create a UFO investigation uh, unit at the, at the United Nations level. And this aim um, was hindered by Germany's permanent mission to the United Nations, among others. The Austrians uh, played along <laughs> as well. So uh, I made some research in the political archives and I found this telegram, for example, which shows, which says, Quite apart from the wider implications of such resolution draft, the reference to the Outer Space Committee alone has its misgivings as it would incur Grenada's desire to become a member of the Outer Space Committee, which would therefore be constantly occupied with the UFO question. And SPC will probably finish treating this item until the end of week. Until then, the United States and Austria will try to persuade Gren Grenada to withdraw its resolution draft and to accept a more general declaration which invites interested member states to become a member of a non-UN committee for the study of UFOs. So you see, even back then, Germany did not have the slightest interest in supporting anything related to UFOs. Another interesting thing happened uh, in 1993. You remember the Belgium UFO wave? Um, that was a very important development also on, uh, on a political level. In uh, the 1990s, uh, you had hundreds of people seeing triangular-shaped craft over Belgium, and as a consequence, the member of the European Parliament, Elio Di Rupo, tabled a motion for a resolution on the creation of a European observatory for UFOs. So he decided to draw up a report, and for his report to the Parliament, to the European Parliament, uh, Professor Reggie uh, contacted all air forces of the European Community member states. Only France and Italy shared their findings with the official European um, Community rapporteur. Spain refused to cooperate on the grounds that his data fell under the military secret. And the Germans were even better. They said, the German Air Force said that it was not competent in this matter, and it, but it did not indicate which service was competent. So. <laughs> So they didn't even say it's secret, they say oh, basically nothing. And that's the official line in Germany. Here you see our former Minister of the Interior, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, in 2008 he stated, an authority or institution at the federal level 
which records or evaluates alleged sightings of UFOs and projects such as those described by you are not known here, which is an interesting way to say it, because for him being the Minister of the Interior, he should know whether there is something or not. It's interesting, he says, are not known here, you know, so I'd always been wondering what that actually means. Um, it's not that politicians in Germany are generally not interested in the subject. Um, from time to time you have uh, members of the German Bundestag, which is the German federal parliament, ask interesting questions, like this one from the Liberal Party um, in 2008. He asked, how many sightings of so-called UFOs or extraterrestrials has the federal government registered since 2000? And does the federal government intend, after the British and French governments have published their files on UFO sightings, to also publish their files on sightings of UFOs and extraterrestrials in Germany? And the answer of the German government is, the government has no information on sightings of so-called UFOs or extraterrestrials in Germany, and there are no, accordingly, there are no files on UFO sightings that could be considered for publication. And I mean, just, you know, I, I see this in the contrast of what's happening here in the United Kingdom, you know, you have thousands of pages of government documents relating to UFOs. Another uh, member of the German parliament uh, from the Green Party here asked in the same year, what is the federal government's estimate of the probability of the existence of intelligent ET life and what is the estimated probability that ETs will land on the territory of the Federal Republic of Germany? And the government answered that they have no knowledge that would permit a reliable assessment of the probability of extraterrestrial life. According to the current state of scientific knowledge, the government considers a landing of aliens on the territory of, the, of Germany to be out of the question. <laughs> out of the question, you know. You see, the Germans, they have actually traveled all, the, all uh, space that's available to us and even unavailable to us, they know that it's out of the question, you know. Okay, so in um, more or less the same year, I, you know, I also started to do inquiries because that was, for me, it was really interesting to see and I just wanted to know how is it that in 21 countries around the world, and I have compiled a whole list and all of that, um, uh, Brazil, you know, Italy, Spain, all those countries, I have all those files. Um, how is it that Germany is like this black hole? In, I mean, you know, I grew up in East Germany, in Leipzig. That was the former um, Soviet zone. And uh, we didn't have bananas in East Germany. So there was a, a joke which said, um, why are bananas curved? because they had to make a turn around East Germany for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to UFOs, it seems like it's more or less the same, even though I don't know so many reports about curved UFOs. But, you know, I just couldn't imagine that there are no files at all and that no government agency is interested in the subject. So I started to do some inquiries and I asked the, the former Minister of Defense, Karl Theodor zu Guttenberg, about uh, possibly existing UFO files, and I received the, uh, the following answer. Throughout the existence of the Bundeswehr, there has, not been, there has been no case in which an initially unidentified flying object was attributed to an extraterrestrial origin. Accordingly, the Federal Ministry of Defense does not keep any records on the UFO phenomenon described by you. What you, what you need to know, by the way, is I never asked about UFOs related to extraterrestrial or anything. You know, I completely avoided the term extraterrestrial. I, I, I really just asked about UFOs. So this was a way for them to, you know, not having to answer my, my question. In other answers to members of the public, the German military even went as far as to state categorically that since the foundation of the German Bundeswehr, the German armed forces, they never had anything unusual on their radar screens which they could not eventually identify. Which is weird, because, well, the Swiss have... <laughs> the Swiss have registered unidentified radar returns over German territory with their Swiss radar stations. Like in this case, on May, on May 5th, 1996, a NATO early warning radar station in Messstetten, that's near the, the Swiss-German border. The Swiss-German border is this green line here. 
it's all a little, little bit blurry. Um, this is the Swiss-German border. This is the NATO um, early warning radar station, and there is a no-fly zone here, which is marked in red, and there should be absolutely nothing in it, and yet there are unidentified radar returns. By the way, another interesting radar plot is this one from June 18, 1993. That was over Swiss territory, and there was an unidentified object traveling with approximately 240 kilometers per hour. Please don't ask me how much that is in miles now, I don't know. Um, and while the radar operators are trying to identify that object, it suddenly accelerates and turns, makes a sharp angle turn, and shoots away at Mach 4. So, Mach 4, a right angle turn at Mach 4, which is um, interesting because it seems that UFOs do not only not obey our um, flight regulations, but not even our natural laws. So, um, all those radar plots, by the way, um, were uh, first published by uh, Elobrand von Ludwiger, the, the astrophysicist I mentioned before, and um, yeah, okay. In uh, 2009, I had the chance to get in touch with um, a member of the German Bundestag. This is her, actually, um, during the interview. I didn't do the interview myself. It was a colleague of mine. We presented her a briefing document that we had written for politicians and journalists, um, which contains all these kinds of information, valuable information on, on UFOs. And um, we asked her, how is it that this United Nations decision 33426 was actually never implemented in Germany? So she was very kind. She said, well, I have no idea. Um, but you know what? I will ask the scientific service of the Bundestag to draft a report on that question why the UN decision 33426 has never been implemented in Germany. And I will also commission the scientific service of the Bundestag to um, write a report about how UFOs are treated um, by European authorities. And um, sure enough, only a couple of weeks later, I had a, a big envelope in my mailbox. Um, it was a very nice uh, letter, and she sent me those uh, studies. And those are the studies from the scientific service of the German Bundestag the search for extraterrestrial life and the adoption of UN Resolution A33426 about the observation of unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial life forms, and the other one about the European Union and how it deals with the subject of UFOs. This study undertaken by the um, scientific service of the Bundestag could not be called scientific, actually. Um, it doesn't contain anything valuable anything new. Um, they even quoted the, um, the United uh, Nations decision uh, from an exopolitics website, so they don't even have a draw with the original uh, text. It was actually a bunch of, of a list of TV documentaries and some things you can read up on the internet, but it contained an interesting statement which was the fact that both Great Britain and France had been dealing with questions about the existence of UFOs and ET life forms and have given up their secrecy to publish it even on the internet suggests the assumption that German authorities or ministries have been dealing with that question as well. So that was new because the German government's position had always been that this is a non-existing subject, that there's no interest, there would be no interest. And they also went on to say, in addition, when the United Nations resolution was adopted in 1978, there was still a very pronounced East-West conflict mentality. At least from a military point of view, there might have been a need at the time to investigate reports of phenomena or phenomena of UFOs. So I reported on this. Um, it was very well received by the, the German public. And then uh, one of the um, people who saw this um, he also wanted to see the document, um, and he was refused access to this study undertaken by the Bundestag. So he decided to sue the government, and that was in 2011. That's Ber this is Berlin citizen uh, Frank Reitemeyer, who wanted to see the study as well. He filed an FOIA request, which was um, denied. He was denied access. 
because the German FOIA um, Freedom of Information Act was only set up in 2006, so it's a re relatively new concept of law in, uh, in Germany. And it would not be applicable to studies written by the Scientific Research Service of the Bundestag. So he sued the German government and the first instance administrative court in Berlin approved his request, uh, request and ordered the Bundestag to release that study. But the Bundestag lodged an appeal uh, because they knew that what was at stake here was not the scientific, what the scientific service knows about UFOs, but whether all the studies ever undertaken by the scientific service in the name of um, members of the Bundestag should uh, or should not be available to members of the public. In 2012, um, we're, st you know, we're still trying to find out what does the German government know? What is it? Uh, is there an authority dealing with UFOs? If so, which authority? Is there anything? You know, where, where do you start if you want to find German UFO files? So in 2012, a friend of mine who's the head of, who used to be the head of a German UFO association started to write letters to all ministries of the interior of the German individual federal states. Um, and the Ministry of the Interior of North Rhine-Westphalia in the northern west of Germany uh, confirmed that the police forwards, I quote, reports on unexplained aerial phenomena when they are related to airspace security issues to a so-called National Situation and Command Center for Air Safety, that's a NATO, NATO combined air operations center in North Rhine-Westphalia close to the Dutch border. But the Ministry of Defense would not officially confirm that this situation and command center for air safety does in fact receive UFO reports from the police. And I know that when this whole story broke um, back then in 2011, you know, I, I had a lot of calls from uh, co uh, colleagues of mine working for the mainstream press, and one of them was working for a very major news organization in Germany. I can't reveal its name because it would get him into trouble, but he said to me that he called the um, press officer of the Ministry of Defense, and this press officer confirmed to him on the phone um, that the National Situation and Command Center for Air Safety does receive UFO reports from the police, but whenever such a UFO report comes in to the center, which is obliged to investigate whether there is um, a threat to air safety, they will immediately uh, throw those reports into the bin. Which is completely logical for a <laughs> military <laughs> for a military uh, center that, is, um, that was created to investigate possible potential threats to air safety, right? But this was not even officially, you know? He said it on the phone and he said, it's only between us. And of course, I believe my colleague because we had worked together, I had no reason to, uh, not to believe him. Another friend of mine who is the uh, editor-in-chief of a Swiss uh, print magazine, Mysteries magazine, um, he continued that research and he started to do more inquiries to German authorities and in March 2012 he wrote an, um, a letter to um, the German police in North Rhine-Westphalia and asked them about how they handle UFO reports and it was confirmed to him that when it's about accidents in airspace there is no report to that Situation and Command Center for Air Safety, but for all other things, they will be contacted and the information will be forwarded to them. So that was yet another confirmation. Now, what is this National Airspace Situation and Command Center? It is uh, stationed in Udem on the Lower Rhine. It's almost 100 military and civilian employees who have a complete overview of German and European airspace and they have a network of 45 air traffic control and Bundeswehr radar installations, as well as data from AWACS early warning aircraft. So um, they have everything under control. So if there's anything unusual uh, showing up on the radar, in theory, they should know. In 2013, the um, Higher Administrative Court of Berlin Brandenburg revoked the decision uh, to open up the Bundestag UFO, the so-called UFO file, the Bundestag UFO study. 
at this point, the uh, um, plaintiff, Frank Reitemeyer, he was really... Um, he was really depressed, you know. He, he really, he really struggled to take a decision to lodge an appeal because, um, for lack of funding, basically, it was him. It was David against Goliath, you know. Um, he had no money. He was suing the German government. The German government at that point had um, commissioned an international law firm to um, to represent them in court. They had. Um, they had written an, an expertise uh, thing, you know, which must have cost uh, 10,000 euros or something, even more. And Frank uh, Reitemeyer, he didn't have anything. So he was really, you know, he was not really decided to, uh, to continue this, uh, this lawsuit. And I said, hey, come on, we will somehow get the money. Let's do a crowdfunding. And so I supported him. I reported on this case. I helped him put together a crowdfunding campaign so that the trial could continue and that he could um, appeal that decision again so that it would go into the next higher um, instance. In 2013, another interesting thing happened. Um, have you heard of the Stasi? Do you know what the Stasi is? Okay, so that's the Eastern German Secret Service. Um, Stasi UFO files were discovered in 2013. There is a German authority that deals only with um, all the files pertaining to the former state security agency, Staatssicherheit or Stasi, um, and they found some, some of those documents. I have them at home. Um, I must say they're not spectacular, but at least um, it shows that in one instance, uh, five people's police officers from East Germany observed a UFO over Halle in Saxony-Anhalt from different positions in 1985, and the object is said to have burst after a flight northwards behind a barracks of the Soviet armed forces. This incident was immediately reported to Erich Mielke, who was then the head of the Ministry for State Security and the head of the GDR Foreign Intelligence. The um, records of the officer on duty show that the witness descriptions of the object differed from each other, and in addition, experts from the University of Halle, which were concerned with the observation of the sky, were also asked for clarification by the Stasi, but they could not provide any, new info, any information to clarify it. So there were no debris parts discovered from the object but there were newspaper clippings from the then Federal Republic of Germany about light phenomena at the time of the alleged sighting over Halle attached to the files of the state security. Those files also revealed that the Stasi had little interest in UFOs um, instead of interpreting them in the context of possibly extraterrestrial origin, of course, um, the objects were rather regarded as secret weapons or clever attempts by the class enemy to deceive uh, brave communists. <laughs> um, nevertheless, the, the Ministry of, uh, for State Security was very interested in studies on parapsychology from neighboring states on the, of the Warsaw Pact. So one of the Stasi files dealt with topics such as color vision with the skin, dowsing, and telepathy. And an unnamed expert in a file from the early 1970s um, came to the conclusion that Scientists of both world systems are currently seriously concerned with the research and release um, of forces in humans, and that these could not be described as hocus pocus. And remember that early 1970s, that's around the time when the Stanford Research Institute in the United States started to investigate psychic um, capabilities of Yuri Geller, and when they started to develop this remote viewing uh, thing. So, they were actually aware of that. But we, ha we know nothing of um, what the Stasi knew about UFOs yet. So just to remind you, this is the German situation before the German reunification. This is the inner German border. This is, this is Germany as we know it now. Uh, this, uh, this was East Germany and this was West Germany. And there's this is inner German border, which is like the front line of the Cold War at that time. So it would appear more or less logical that secret services or military um, would be interested in UFO sightings 
as the scientific service of the Bundestag had said, because it could very well be spy drones from the political opponents. And um, in fact, it turned out in 2014 that also the BND had UFO files. From 1982 to 86, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, that's the Federal Intelligence Service, the, the Foreign Secret Service of Germany, um, collected and analyzed witness reports on unidentified flying objects along the inner German border. And I made a TV report on this, which uh, I hope you'll be able to follow because I made uh, English subtitles. And I'll just show you so that you see the whole, the whole story. Der eiserne Vorhang. Ein halbes Jahrhundert lang trennte die innerdeutsche Grenze die Bundesrepublik von der DDR. Mit Stacheldraht, Wachhunden und Splitterminen. Der schwer bewachte Todesstreifen markierte die vorderste Front des Kalten Krieges, trennte NATO-Bündnisstaaten von denen des Warschauer Paktes. Doch nicht nur Militärs behielten die Grenze im Auge, sondern auch der Bundesnachrichtendienst, der Auslandsgeheimdienst der Bundesrepublik. Von 1982 bis 86 sammelte und analysierte der BND Zeugenberichte über unidentifizierte fliegende Objekte entlang der innerdeutschen Grenze. Das Bundesarchiv in Koblenz. Hier lagern die Unterlagen, deren Existenz deutsche Bundespolitiker bislang verleugnen. Die eigentlich noch bis zum Jahr 2021 gesperrte UFO-Akte konnte nun der Herausgeber des Online-Portals Grenzwissenschaft aktuell einsehen. Sie trägt den Titel DDR-Grenzsperranlagen an der innerdeutschen Grenze, UFO, und sie enthält auf 67 Seiten Sichtungsberichte und Analysen des Bundesnachrichtendienstes. Die Mehrheit der Akte beinhaltet Fälle, die tatsächlich konventionell erklärbar sind, Flugdrohnen, vornehmlich Ballons, ähm, Radarspiegel, die äh, steigen gelassen wurden. Aber es gibt eben, wie so oft, immer die äh, Ausnahmen, die die Regel dann wiederum bestätigen. Äh, und die zeigen eben Fälle, die unidentifiziert bleiben, auch im Sinne der Bearbeiter der Akte. Einer dieser Fälle trug sich 1986 auf der Ostseeinsel Fehmarn zu. Am frühen Morgen des 26. August beobachten drei Grenzschutzbeamte aus dem Fenster ihres Dienstraumes ein hell leuchtendes Objekt, das langsam auf den Fährbahnhof Puttgarden zufliegt und dort in einer Höhe von 50 bis 60 Metern in der Luft stehen bleibt. Die Zeugen vernehmen keinerlei Fluggeräusche, nur ein relativ leises Summen. Form, Farbe und Größe können die Grenzschützer aufgrund der strahlenförmig blendenden Beleuchtung des Objektes nicht ausmachen. Die seltsame Sichtung über Fehmarn, nur einer der interessanten UFO-Fälle des Bundesnachrichtendienstes. Für Andreas Müller ist klar, die UFO-Akte des BND ist mehr als nur eine anekdotische Sammlung von Sichtungsberichten, denn sie dokumentiert, auf welche Weise der BND jahrelang und systematisch UFO-Forschung betrieb. Zum Beispiel, es gibt eine handschriftliche Notiz, die sagt, die, die, die dazu auffordert, bitte einen UFO-Vorgang anlegen. Das heißt, diese Prozedere, diese Automatismen gab es. Es gab vor allem dieser Begriff UFO, wurde offenbar auch über die Stellen hinweg verwendet. Jeder wusste, was ein UFO-Vorgang ist. Das ist eigentlich eine ganz interessante Erkenntnis aus dieser Akte. Es gab äh, Amtshilfe äh, zwischen den einzelnen Stellen. Und es geht auch aus, aus Notizen ganz klar hervor, dass die Untersucher dieser Fälle ein, ein herausgehobenes Interesse an weiteren, zum Beispiel Befragungen von Zeugen hatten. UFOs über der innerdeutschen Grenze. Die seltsamen Flugobjekte wurden also auch hierzulande dokumentiert und analysiert, wie der wissenschaftliche Dienst des Deutschen Bundestages bereits 2009 in einer bis heute zurückgehaltenen Studie mutmaßte. Gerade zu Zeiten des Kalten Krieges, so die Autoren, hätte durchaus ein Interesse daran bestehen können, UFO-Sichtungen nachzugehen aus Angst vor Spionagedrohnen des ideologischen Gegners. Die nun bekannt gewordenen Akten geben den Wissenschaftlern des Bundestages recht. Doch wahrscheinlich 
bilden sie nicht mehr als die Spitze des Eisbergs. Die Frage ist nun, was sonst noch in deutschen Archiven auf die Veröffentlichung wartet. Denn in vielen Ländern weltweit stammt der Großteil der veröffentlichten UFO-Akten von Seiten des Militärs. Doch im Gegensatz zu 20 anderen Ländern auf der Welt herrscht bei der deutschen Bundeswehr bislang dazu nur eisiges Schweigen. So those were the files of the German Federal Intelligence Service, which is not the German military. And as I just noted, I don't know, could you follow the, the subtitles? Could you read them well? Okay, good. There were some UFO files from the BND, but we still didn't know what the German military had. In June 2015, the Federal Administrative Court of Germany finally decides that studies undertaken by the Scientific Research Service of the Bundestag are to be released under the German Freedom of Information Act. So this does not only count for the now famous UFO, so-called UFO study, but for any, like for all the studies ever undertaken by the scientific service of the Bundestag for um, members of the German parliament, which is really important, an important thing, because um, you remember when uh, the United States and uh, I think it was Great Britain and France um, decided to conduct airstrikes on Syria a couple of months ago, and they said, well, um, um, we couldn't do otherwise because the United Nations Security Council was, was obviously occupied and, and blocked. So, so uh, the German Chancellor Merkel and other German politicians said, we find it positive that um, those countries have, have uh, taken the responsibility to conduct those airstrikes. And, um, and um, the German scientific service of the German Bundestag actually contradicted and said, no, this is against international law, period. Um, and this was a very important subject on the German news, and we could not have this, uh, we wouldn't have this instance of, I would say, rational um, uh, reasoning about uh, what's going on in the world without uh, this man, Frank Reitermeier, who helped to bring studies from the scientific service to the public. So, in a way, we helped write legal history in Germany. Um, this is like... Those studies by the scientific service are like the El Dorado for journalists, but they are maybe the Pandora's box for Germany's government. Um, however, we still don't have any clue about what the German military may know about UFOs at that point. And that's why in, in August of 2015, I made another approach. And I knew that if I would write yet another letter to the Ministry of Defense, I would receive more or less the same answer. So I chose a, um, a way, I did it in the most public way possible. So I chose um, to go to a press conference by the speaker of the German government and the speakers of the ministries um, and ask the speaker of the German government personally. And this is what he said. Robert Fleischer von Exo Magazin TV. Ich habe eine etwas ungewöhnliche, aber durchaus ernst gemeinte Frage. In 20 Ländern hat das Militär bereits unidentifizierte Flugobjekte registriert, jahrzehntelang Akten dazu angelegt und sie nach jahrzehntelanger Geheimhaltung auch freigegeben. In fünf Ländern gibt es sogar staatliche UFO-Untersuchungsbehörden. Meine Frage an Herrn Seibert, warum kümmert sich hier in Deutschland eigentlich niemand darum, ähm, und an den Sprecher des Verteidigungsministeriums, was müsste passieren, damit Frau von der Leyen die Einstufung von möglicherweise doch existenten geheimen UFO-Akten neu überdenkt? Wir danken für die interessante Frage und sind, sind gespannt auf die Antwort. Ich kann nicht behaupten, dass ich in irgendeiner Weise ein Experte auf diesem Gebiet wäre. Ich weiß, dass es eine Reihe von Menschen gibt, die damit sehr viel Zeit verbringen und im Internet ähm, sich dazu austauschen. Im, es steht äh, nicht im Mittelpunkt der Politik dieser Bundesregierung. Es steht nicht mal an den Rändern der Politik dieser Bundesregierung. Wir haben auch nicht das Gefühl, dass es äh, in irgendeiner Weise eine Frage ist, die für das, äh, das äh, gute Zusammenleben in Deutschland oder in der Welt von Bedeutung wäre. Vielleicht könnte man hier die Phrase benutzen, die Frage stellt sich nicht. Aber genau, wollte ich jetzt mal nicht. Vielleicht das Verteidigungsministerium noch? Also, ich möchte denen eigentlich nichts mehr hinzufügen. Aber mir, also mir sind weder die Vorgänge 
noch äh, irgendwelche Akten, die ich bezüglich bekannt und sehen Sie es mir bitte nach, dass ich in diesem Rahmen jetzt hier äh, weder was sagen kann, wirklich nichts sagen kann dazu. Also das ist äh, eine, eine Sache, die ähm, äh, in unser, äh, uns in unserer Verantwortung nicht rumtreibt, wirklich nicht. So, what do you think of that, being British citizens, <laughs> knowing what the British Ministry of Defense has published throughout the decades and done? What's your, I mean, if you see, this is the speaker of the German Ministry of Defense. Did you notice all the people laughing in the room? You know, can you imagine the, the, uh, the atmosphere there for, for me asking that question and having hundreds of people laughing at me? It was really <laughs> weird. So that, that didn't bring any success, um, but I had some publicity. Um, in 2016, I noticed that Hillary Clinton um, started talking about UFOs during the United States electoral campaign. She was on the Jimmy Kimmel show, she referred to it as UAP and stuff. I had the impression that she didn't really know anything about UFOs at all, and that she was not so interested in the subject, but she was told by John Podesta, go and talk about UFOs, may bring us some votes. Anyway, I thought, well, uh, we could try this in Germany too, right? I mean, it would be highly unlikely that the German Chancellor Merkel, um, first of all, goes into a talk show on German television, <laughs> and secondly, that she would um, start referring to UFOs by herself. But I thought, well, I could try to ask um, candidates of all political parties who, who want to get elected again, because after all, as you will notice, by the way, the German Bundestag looks like a giant UFO. <laughs> Even from the outside, you know. So, <laughs> so I decided to send out letters and emails to candidates of every political party before the German federal elections in 2017. So during the um, campaigns, I sent out those letters and I asked all those um, politicians the following questions. Will you, after being elected to the Bundestag, make sure that German authorities or ministries make their UFO files public? That is the question that I asked to um, a couple of dozen politicians. Not all of them came back to me, but some did. This is the political spectrum in Germany, so between left and right, uh, I'm, I mean, there are many ways to show the political spectrum, but this is like the most common in, in Germany. So those are the, uh, the socialists, the left, left wing party, the Green Party, which is important in Germany. Then you have the Social Democratic Party. Um, you have the Christian Democratic Union and Christian Social Union, which always um, show up together. This is where Angela Merkel comes from. Those are the Liberals, um, FDP, and this is um, the a relatively new party, Alternative for Germany. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it is more rights-oriented. Um, so I asked politicians of all those um, political parties what they think on UFO files, and here are some statements from members of the government, of the then government coalition between SPD and CDU. Um, which is the same coalition that we have now. Um, so Clemens Binninger, this one from the Christian Democratic Union said, I have no knowledge of UFO sightings and in this context, I also refer to your conversation with government spokesman Stefan Seibert and a spokesman of the Federal Ministry of Defense in September 2015 at the Federal Press Conference. The two spokespersons had no knowledge of any such events. So he watched my, my video or they had some record on it. Thomas Oppermann, important politician from the SPD, said, I can only underline what my colleague Clemens Binninger already told you. I know nothing on UFOs. Hubertus Heil, SPD, said, I can only underline what my colleague Thomas Oppermann already told you on UFOs. <laughs> so, they were completely the same emails, you know. Um, then I was electrified uh, by a statement from uh, the head of the Green Party. She said, the secret documents on unidentified flying objects must be made public. I said, great. But then I read on, she said, unfortunately, however, these are only available in Klingon and partly blacked out. If you're familiar with this language or know someone who is, please contact the BND. So, so bullshit, you know. Um, 
Then I had another interesting reaction. Uh, do you know this guy, Martin Schulz? He was Merkel's main rival, uh, main opponent during the last federal elections. He also used to be the president of the European Parliament from 2012 to 2017. And in August 2017, I had a chance to ask Angela Merkel's main opponent, Martin Schulz, personally, whether he would open UFO files. So keep in mind, this is um, her main opponent at that time. And he gave a very interesting answer. Eine weitere Frage, die, muss ich persönlich sagen, zu meiner Überraschung relativ weit vorne gelandet ist in der ähm, Online-Abstimmung, stellt ein Leser der Leipziger Volkszeitung, Herr Robert Fleischer. Moment, das ist hier. Hallo. Guten Tag, Herr Schulz, schön, dass Sie da sind. Ähm, mir geht es um die Informationsfreiheit in Deutschland. Und ich meine meine Frage wirklich total ernst. Also in 21 Ländern auf der Welt ähm, sind vormals geheim gehaltene UFO-Akten veröffentlicht worden, unter anderem in Frankreich, Großbritannien, Italien und Spanien. Und die komplette Liste hätte ich hier. Also falls Sie das interessiert, gebe ich Ihnen das gerne. Ähm, sollte man das nicht auch in Deutschland machen? Und würden Sie sich als Bundeskanzler dafür einsetzen? Und meine Frage ist nicht, ob Sie was über UFO-Akten wissen in Deutschland, sondern ob Sie sich dafür einsetzen würden, dass geheime UFO-Akten öffentlich werden. Ähm, ich muss bekennen, ich habe mich mit dem Thema noch nicht befasst. Die in, Frankreich, in Frankreich werden die von einer staatlichen UFO-Forschungsbehörde erforscht, diese ja. UFOs. Ich versuche, nee, nee, Moment mal, ich versuche, versuche Ihnen, äh, ich hoffe, rechtlich einmal freie Antwort zu geben. Wenn diese Akten nicht veröffentlicht werden, weil sie einer bestimmten Klassifizierung unterworfen werden, als geheim, dann kann ich Ihnen jetzt nicht versprechen, ohne entsprechende gesetzliche Rahmenbedingungen sie zu veröffentlichen. Denn ein Bundeskanzler der Bundesrepublik ist an die gesetzlichen Vorgaben gebunden. Ich kann Ihnen aber zusagen, ich würde prüfen, was sind die Voraussetzungen, äh, warum sind sie als geheim klassifiziert und äh, wenn es keiner weiteren Geheimhaltung in diesem Bereich bedarf, dann würde ich dem Deutschen Bundestag vorschlagen, sie zu veröffentlichen. Vielen Dank. So that was for German, for German circumstances, this was sort of a revolutionary statement, as you see. So that was interesting. And when he um, said that, there was some interest on the German media. People said Martin Schulz wants to open UFO files. And um, my local newspaper came up to me, wanted to interview me. And they showed a photo with some uh, government documents from Great Britain, by the way, showing UFO and, and said, and I thought now they would start to report seriously on the subject and that there may very well be secret German UFO files. But the article was basically about, look at this nutty guy, what, you, what he dared to ask our chancellor, a candidate. You know. But sure enough, only a day or two days after um, Martin Schulz's statement, I received a reply from the office of Angela Merkel, directly from the chancellor's office. I had also asked her about German UFO files, and uh, her answer was the Space Operations Center of the German military, of the German Bundeswehr, is tasked with monitoring all near-Earth objects, and since its beginnings there has not been any data collection related to unknown flying objects, therefore there is no material to be published. And um, the Space Operations Center, you need to know about this, is, um, is also located at the same place where this National Situation and Command Center for Air Safety is, is located. It's the same facility, but it's another branch. Um, and um, so um, I insisted, and I said, now I have the email address from someone inside the chancellor's office, so <laughs> I, can, I can ask questions. And I said, look, I have all this, all those documents pointing to the NLFZ Uh, this situation room for air safety. What, what about this? Of course, the Space Operations Center doesn't deal with anything in the atmosphere. It's about space. But what about this? They are concerned with air safety. Have you looked there? And they said, there are no documents on the subject you have requested from the National Situation and Command Center for Air Safety. And, and they made sure, please understand, there will be no further correspondence with you on the same subject in the future. But I dared to reply and say thank you. 
I mean, I could talk a little more about this um, because, in fact, I had also made some inquiries to the press office of the German military and asked them what, uh, what is the administrative process in the event that um, there is something unusual on this, in the sky, some unexplained phenomena in the sky, that's how I called it, because I knew that the German FOIA um, would only relate to administrative things, not to the actual content itself for security reasons and all this. So I said, what are the administrative procedures in, in that case if something unexplained is, um, is registered in the sky? And the German Bundeswehr replied, well, in that case, uh, we do some investigation, whether it could be space debris, and we even consult with a professor from a German university and all of this. And when I asked the same question to the Ministry of Defense as a uh, freedom of information request, I received the answer, well, there's no information at all we can give you about this. So you see that I'm being stalemated in a way, you know. Um, anyway, so the question remains, are there really no UFO encounters from the German military? How is it possible that the German military doesn't deal with UFOs, unlike as opposed to more than 20 countries in the world. How is that possible? And I just couldn't understand how that would be possible, if that's possible, and then I met, and it was just recently, I met a very interesting man. And that man is a retired general from the German military. Um, he was in the audience during one of my lectures a um, couple of months ago, and. Afterwards, he came to me and he said, it's very interesting, all those 20 countries, and, but there's also something interesting I want to tell you to add to your picture. And, oh, and by the way, I had my own UFO encounter. And I said, what? what what's your UFO encounter? Tell me. So he said, um, and he's, he's actually, he's a medical doctor in the rank of a general. So um, he was, uh, he had worked in the highest, in high government ranks for 14 years, including the German Ministry of Defense and shape NATO headquarters in Belgium. So on the evening of December 5, 1982, this um, retired general was called, he was not a general back then, I assume, he was called on a rescue mission to save an old man who had suffered a cardiac arrest. Since there were no medical emergencies, uh, emergency helicopters available in that region, the military was called in to assist with their search and rescue helicopter. It took him quite some time to resuscitate that old man and they flew him to a hospital in Celle. Um, and when they arrived there, he, the, the old man had another cardiac arrest and the medics started running down the hallway. A nurse saw the former general and, his, and the other crew who were still exhausted from having resuscitated that man and from the flight and offered them, an, a, the helicopter crew, a coffee before they were to return to their base in Fassberg in Lower Saxony. Between midnight and 1 a.m. on December 6, they uh, climbed into their helicopter again. The weather that night was very bad. Um, low clouds, drizzling rain, and their helicopter was flying at a low altitude around 50 meters above surface and around only 20 meters above the treetops. So this is to give you an idea where that is. Um, this red dot here is where he was stationed and the, uh, the hospital was around here, cellar. And to give you a better idea, this is the hospital in cellar. This is uh, where he was stationed. And this is the area where it happened. So when they arrived in this area near the small town of Eschede, Eschede is here, um, they suddenly noticed some glowing lights on the left-hand side. And he said, we wondered, why is it glowing in the clouds? It was a very bright light comparable to that of a spotlight. But it, he said it had a different quality. It didn't hurt to the eye. Um, he described it as very bright, green, whitish light, and it was continuously flowing, like from a spring, he said. It was it's difficult for me to imagine. It was continuously flowing light, um, and it flew alongside them. The distance, he said, was difficult to ascertain. He estimated it around 100 meters. They were flying at around 160 kilometers per hour. 
The pilot said to the onboard mechanic guy, who is flying there at this weather? And they were wondering if this was some secret aircraft. They decided to call the tower of a nearby airfield, Langenhagen, to check whether they had traffic. But the controller answered they only had their helicopter on their screen and nothing else. The strange light accompanied the helicopter for about one to two minutes. That's what you see. This is the helicopter. This is the strange light when it was initially in the, in the clouds and then it came um, yeah, to behind, from behind the clouds and was visible. Um, then suddenly it made a sharp right angle turn towards the helicopter and they were all shocked. The, the pilot tore the helicopter sharp, sharply downright in order to avoid collision and when the light had approached the helicopter at about 10 meters, the general heard a static radio noise on his headset. The onboard mechanic screamed, watch out, you're getting into the trees. Then the object changed its direction very rapidly and shot upwards in the air where it disappeared in another glowing cloud. Fortunately, the helicopter came to rest above a small lake in the forest because this was all forest and the pilot managed to stabilize the aircraft. They kept hovering there for a couple of minutes to see if the light would return and to sort of recover from what had just happened. And they also contacted the airfield Langenhagen again to verify if there was really no other traffic in the area. But the controller insisted that they were alone and he added, but we just saw you flying a strange maneuver, everything okay? And after a while they continued their flight back to Fassberg and the weather was so bad, they had to open the door for landing. The light, he said, demonstrated such an incredible maneuverability, way beyond anything he had seen before. Mass inertia law didn't seem to apply to it, which is why he is not sure if it was a solid object at all. There were no physical interferences with the helicopter, besides of that static noise on, on the radio, on the headset. And after the landing, the four men talked about the incident and decided they would not report it for fear of losing their good reputations and flight license. He kept this incident for himself for many decades until in 2012 he read the Cometa report and he saw that there is um, a similar, similar uh, reports from other pilots. So that is when he decided to go public about his sighting and I said, but anonymously, and I said, wow, that's interesting. So, so there are UFO cases with German military involvement, but how come there is no official interest uh, in the subject? And he goes, and this is just to remind you of the, the situation during the Cold War. Those are the occupation zones. Those were the British, of course. They had the biggest slice, one of the biggest. <laughs> this is the French and the American sector, and this is the Soviet zone. And he said, you need to understand that Germany was an occupied country, and, lit and, and um, uh, after World War II, Germany was not a sovereign state until 1990. He said, it may very well be the case that German authorities are the exception to the rule that they are not dealing with UFOs, because the air supremacy was divided among the Allied powers. Uh, Britain, France, Americans, the Soviets, and I think the, net, the, 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 the Dutch were also involved. Um, and this uh, situation, he said, led German authorities to become some sort of resignated and afraid to take responsibility over their own matters. And he said, over the years, this resignation um, and this fear of, of uh, you know, uh, taking responsibility has become sort of institutionalized. And whenever there was something bizarre, the Germans were happy to leave it to the Allied powers, mainly the United States, United Kingdom and France. So he was kind of suggesting that whenever it came to a UFO sighting, the German authorities were actually very happy to uh, keep it to the Americans or any other Allied power to investigate. And that may very well be the explanation why German authorities um, are not, um, have not been dealing with this issue. And there is even a case um, in, from German UFO history which shows that this may actually be true. So this is uh, the German map again, and um, the following case um, happened here. This is, um, I would say, in the middle of nowhere, Pampa. <laughs> between Diepholz and Petershagen. 
and it happened on August 13, 1976. It was a UFO encounter with the pilot of a Piper Arrow PA-28 aircraft. I cannot say his name. His name is Wilfried Detring. He was, um, this is a long time ago, he was a member of a, a MUFON association afterwards. Um, the pilot of that Piper Arrow aircraft was flying at um, 3,500 feet when he noticed a strange light approaching from the northeast at 9 o'clock and after 3 to 5 minutes the object came closer and took a fixed position on the Piper's left wing. The object was oval shaped and very bright, yellow in its center with an indistinct flame orange boundary. Its diameter subtended about 3.5 degrees of arc. Suddenly the Piper went into two rapid 360 degree clockwise rolls from which the pilot had to recover manually. And he discovered that he had dropped about 500 feet during the roll and recovery maneuver. And when he next checked his, in checked his instrument panel, he discovered that his magnetic compass was spinning in clockwise directions so fast that he couldn't read the number in its square, in its uh, window. So looking outside again, he saw that the UFO was still behind him and the pilot climbed back to his cruise altitude and called on the radio to flight control at Hanover Airport uh, to the east of his flight position and the air traffic controller told him that the radar showed both his airplane and another object nearby. The controller said that an aircraft would be sent to investigate. Little more than four minutes later, two US Air Force F-4 Phantom jets arrived on either side of him, traveling between 400 and 500 miles per hour. The jet on the right side was slightly lower, closer and ahead of the jet on the left the pilot was certain that they were American planes. Just as the jets arrived, the UFO accelerated forward and then upward at about a 30 degree angle above the horizontal and turned right, passing in front of his aircraft. It quickly, uh, quickly outdistanced its pursuers and was out of sight in a matter of seconds. The compass eventually returned to normal operation after the UFO had departed. Now, the interesting point is, this is a sketch of what he experienced, done by himself and first published in the U International UFO Reporter, I think in 2004. It was, this uh, encounter was investigated uh, by Richard Haynes um, with the help of Illobrand von Ludwiger. Now the interesting thing is what happened after the landing. Um, within minutes of the landing, a military van without license plates pulled up to his plane and five men in business suits got out. They would not identify who they worked for. He was taken to an underground room on the airport property where a man sat behind a desk. Two of the original men left the room. The others then began asking him detailed questions about the sighting. And he had the impression, however, that one of the men was an American. This questioning went on for about three hours. He had to repeat the entire event over and over again, as well as tell technical details and at one point he was politely asked to, asked to read and sign a form printed in German. It stated that he, had, that he agreed never to disclose the details of his UFO sighting. The pilot bravely declined to sign the form despite the fact that it was firmly suggested that his pilot's license might be suspended if he did not do so. After this, they finally let him go and later it was discovered that parts of the aircraft um, landing gear and engine crankshaft were strongly and permanently magnetized and they had to be replaced at a later date. So you see, there is a UFO encounter over German territory. The pilot calls for Mayday. There are obviously American fighter jets uh, coming up to him. Um, they accompany him um, to land on Hanover Airport where he is eventually um, debriefed or questioned by American, obviously American military personnel on German territory in 1976. So this might be the example of that, um, at that time, um, normal procedure when it came to UFO sightings. And remember, Germany still to this day has uh, hosts the biggest U.S. military base outside the United States, Rammstein, you know, and I think it's currently 33,000 uh, U.S. troops who are stationed in Germany and another 1,500 um, are going to show up in, within the next two years. 
So it may be the case that this is still going on, that whenever there are UFO cases, UFO encounters, it is the Americans who take charge of it. On the political side, recently there seems to be some renewed interest in the subject of UFOs and especially um, extraterrestrial life. There was a par parliamentary question to the government only a short time ago, in July 2018, another deputy of the um, Green Party asked the German government what precautions, protocols or plans for a possible first contact with ET Live exist on the part of the federal government and its subordinate authorities and if they have ever talked about it with other countries. And the answer is there are no protocols or plans for a possible first contact because the federal government considers the first contact on the territory of, of Germany to be extremely unlikely according to the current state of scientific knowledge. So you see, within 10 years, German government has made considerable, considerable progress in um, estimating the situation of first contact. In 2008, they said it's out of the question. 10 years later, at least, it's, they call it, they deem it extremely unlikely, so it's not out of the question any longer. So you see, we make we made huge progress during the last 10 years. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Round of applause for all of us Thank you. Thank you very much.